I'm here to talk about uh, secure firmware updates for IoT devices. Um, okay. Uh, first of all, I want to give you a very, very brief in overview of my company, and uh, then I will introduce you on uh, uh, Secure Boot, uh, what it is, why it matters, why it's so important. Uh, then uh, I'll describe how we implemented our own uh, mechanism of uh, Secure Boot, which is based on a, on a bootloader, it's called Wolf Boot, which is an open source product. And, uh, and then uh, I hope there will be time for some uh, questions and discussion. So, first of all, the overview I promised uh, about the company. The company was founded in 2004 um, by uh, Larry Stefanik and Todd Uska, uh, and it's uh, headquartered in Seattle, Washington. And uh, the main product we work on is an embedded open source SSL TS TLS library that's called Wolf SSL as the company. Um, you can see us as a, an alternative to OpenSSL. Actually, when uh, they started this project, uh, OpenSSL was already there, uh, but it didn't have the right features and the right development approach uh, to fit into a specific uh, uh, open source project. Uh, the founders were involved in uh, MySQL a lot, so the first target was actually uh, write an SSL library that would fit uh, for MySQL, um, uh, then again, uh, since it's been designed in a modular way and uh, uh, with a very small footprint, uh, that was especially successful in the embedded, uh, um, uh, in the embedded development. Uh, nowadays, uh, we have uh, uh, still the headquarters in Washington, Seattle, Washington. Uh, our main development site is in Bozeman, Montana. Um, we have people, developers, in Portland, Oregon, in Tokyo, in Stockholm, uh, Brisbane, Australia. Myself, I'm based in Amsterdam. Uh, some of you know me. I've been uh, working and living here in Belgium for about nine years. And uh, they recently moved to Amsterdam. And uh, um, so our focus is, of course, on connectivity. For those who know um, already SSL or TLS uh, protocol, uh, what we actually do uh, nowadays also, we focus on uh, other different uh, uh, area, um, such as message uh, passing protocol like uh, MQTT. Uh, we provide an SSH um, implementation that's uh, uh, small enough to fit into microcontrollers. Uh, and then uh, some data, we have uh, about uh, more than 1,000 OEM customers. Uh, uh, we grew um, last year up until 40 developers. Um, we recently uh, actually um, uh, hired uh, uh, Daniel Stenberg, the maintainer of Curl. He left the Mozilla Foundation to come work for us. And uh, so we also uh, provide uh, technical support on Curl, uh, which probably some of you already use. And it's a very popular uh, client um, in the embedded Linux uh, uh, world. And we do have strategic partnership uh, in the market. Uh, um, very important names you can see as well. Um, then, finally, uh, I introduce you uh, to Secure Boot, uh, which is the scope of this presentation. Um, I'm going to tell you what it is, why it matters a little bit. I try to sync those two laptops so I can... Um, so we do recognize a trend uh, here about uh, many and many embedded devices getting connected, right? And um, so more and more devices uh, are getting connected to the internet. Uh, and uh, this trend uh, seems to be constant. Uh, uh, that the number is going to double in uh, two, three to five years. But where are we standing today as uh, embedded architects, developers, designers, integrators. Uh, are we implementing uh, the right standards and technologies for what concerns security in particular? And uh, do we do the same thing that's done in other markets, in the IT market, which is vulnerability management? Do we do that properly? Because I also, I, I've read a question uh, on the, on the meetup page, the pre-meeting question, it was very interesting. It was about vulnerability that was well known and affected uh, many different devices uh, from many different vendors because they all 
chose to adapt that specific uh, industry given uh, uh, standard which is not an open standard and that there's a big difference there and we'll see why so my question here and i'm asking today it's an old joke i know it's been five years we hear this but uh, is security still the s in iot uh, i think it shouldn't be right um if we do things right but let's uh, let's take a, a step uh, in one direction first let's talk about embedded linux um there it things are a little bit simpler the security strategy is actually uh, a direct consequence it's directly derived from a uh, uh, where Linux is actually popular, so um, uh, cloud environments, uh, uh, mobile phone development. Uh, so you have frequent updates, you have package managers, uh, uh, you have uh, even kernel updates are easy because the bootloader can relocate the kernel wherever it wants and just decides uh, that it boots it from uh, uh, an address that's uh, uh, completely invented because you have virtual memory on, uh, on, your, on your CPU, so you can relocate your code which is compiled as a position independent anywhere, including the kernel itself. So, in Linux things uh, are moving a little faster, so this was not our first concerns when uh, we started talking about uh, um, secure boot. Although, uh, WolfSSL is in all Linux distributions, it's in OpenWRT, it's in uh, Yocto, uh, so you already have whatever you need to implement TLS security by design with the latest uh, and greatest uh, uh, protocols and uh, open standards. And we do add a few key features uh, to open source products such as Bearbox uh, that has uh, TPM support uh, um, to store uh, uh, keys uh, and, and using hardware encryption from, a, from a external, um, from additional hardware uh, that could be uh, part of your of your hardware design, uh, and in this case TPM, uh, which is the latest technology uh, for um, uh, this uh, kind of operations. Um, what happens if we look at the microcontrollers world? Um, that changes completely because, first of all, uh, developing software probably most of you know on a microcontroller uh, poses uh, an incredible amount of. Uh, uh, issues that if you come from uh, coding from uh, for for a personal computer applications uh, or libraries uh, or fr even from embedded Linux, uh, you had no idea uh, about that. That what happened to me when I switched. I was coming from the Linux world and I switched to microcontrollers, and I was a bit disoriented, especially by the the constraints uh, of the um, uh, uh, the physical memory. And uh, but nowadays. Uh, let's say embedded systems still look like they did 20 years ago so most bare metal real-time OS solutions uh, even those uh, from uh, big brands are still based on the very old paradigm of keeping everything in memory as flat as possible every application uh, even something you um, you download from untrusted sources uh, is able to touch any CPU registry or mess up with your memory allocation at any time. There's no permission, there's no separation, everything is flat. So this uh, means that uh, the whole environment is very unsafe. Programming security on an unsafe uh, environment like this is of course a big risk because whenever you have a single vulnerability in your security code, it means that uh, your entire system is likely to be com compromised and probably your entire fleet at that point. And, uh, so it is really, really easy to write exploits or to write um, malware for microcontrollers. Much easier than it is to uh, write it for uh, a modern Linux system such as an Android device or, uh, or a big data server. Um, moreover, microcontrollers are always uh, shipped by um, vendors with different uh, connectivity technologies and uh, that also contributed to the fact that uh, there is no nowadays there is no standard on doing firmware upgrades on uh, on embedded devices so what we do we reinvent the wheel all the time because today it's ethernet tomorrow it's wi-fi and then it's uh, uh 14 to 5 and then uh, uh it's uh, uh some specific uh, lp1 uh, lora whatever so you can't use your whole system code uh, 
you have to start from scratch because you have different packets, different payload, different bandwidth, different uh, everything. So it is different, difficult to standardize a solution that works uh, for uh, all corner cases. And uh, so what we do normally, what we're busy uh, with most of the time is bringing security standards to microcontrollers. And uh, so we bring secure connectivity that's the same standard, the same open standards you use on your, in your browser, on your web server, we bring it to microcontroller world. And uh, Wolf SSL normally adapts to any type of transport layer. So of course, if th in most of the cases that's TCP IP, uh, but uh, I've seen solutions from customers uh, who implement TLS on top of a serial channel or a CAN bus or uh, whatever specific proprietary uh, connectivity device they have. So uh, the fact is, why are customers still using TLS? Because uh, this is a standard from the IETF, right? So and it evolves, uh, it changes, it fixes vulnerability that are there by design. Most of the time it's not uh, that having a vulnerability is not the developer's fault, but uh, sometimes it can also be because of the, um, some attacker has discovered a defect in the, in the design. And uh, all the research that uh, happens on, on TLS happens uh, openly because uh, uh, universities are working on it, and uh, uh, security specialists are working around the clock uh, to figure out what's happening uh, and fix vulnerabilities and uh, develop uh, and, uh, uh, and deliver uh, the, the best uh, solution that has no known vulnerability on the day of the release. So in the common effort of uh, delivering secure systems, uh, secure solutions, uh, we, Wolf SSL, provide you uh, hardware, software, integrators, developers with the latest uh, and greatest uh, um, standards that are implemented. And if we do, both of us, everything we do, everything right, the security is delivered. But this is only valid on the release day. And this is where uh, the vulnerability management uh, uh, comes into, uh, uh, into play. Because it's okay to use the best technology up to the latest standards, you should do that because TLS 1.3 was released last year in August. Uh, we've been one of the first to implement that and, um, uh, and it fixes a lot of ugly vulnerabilities that were present and are still present uh, in the most common TLS version, which is TLS 1.2 nowadays. Uh, because despite the effort of the browser to support the newer standard, still a lot of web servers uh, are lagging behind one or two versions even. And then you get all these uh, funny attacks like uh, with, with these funny names, uh, uh, golden poodle, uh, zombie, zombie poodle and stuff like this. And, uh, and that's what we fight actually every day on, on a regular basis. Uh, so. What is vulnerability management? It's not just having the latest version. That, of course, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a great advantage. Nowadays, uh, um, getting to the market with the, with the product that supports TLS 1.3, it means that it has a longer lifeline, uh, lifetime uh, from the beginning, because most possibly TLS 1.2 will be deprecated a few years before TLS 1.3. And that guarantees you that you already are up to the latest standards. But once the product is released, you have, you must keep everything updated. Because the vulnerability comes, uh, uh, come out on a regular basis. Like weekly, you hear about something new that's happening. Uh, and uh, that's actually a good thing. Because if you think about uh, proprietary solutions, uh, probably you never hear, hear about uh, uh, those kind of vulnerabilities. But there's probably someone who is researching on that and it's not the same approach of keeping everything open and uh, um, let's say the white hat approach of uh, um, uh, exposing the vulnerabilities and willing to fix them. So remember that a single vulnerability compromises your world system and uh, your system might be secure today but 
it's not going to be tomorrow, uh, I can guarantee that. So that's where secure remote updates become a security requirement uh, for those IoT connected devices. And that's a real problem because si since we don't know how to do that, um, we have to figure out a way which is also valid for almost all platforms, right? So that, that was the, the, the problem I got faced uh, uh, with at the beginning. Um, so the first question I asked myself as a developer, how do I do this, right? It's, uh, it's uh, one of the first things. So since we um, normally start from uh, RFCs, right? So that's the open standard. So we wanted to start from, uh, from something similar. And unfortunately, there are no RFCs on how to implement firmware updates for microcontrollers. But the IETF suite group uh, is currently working on a, an internet draft, uh, which is at version 5 uh, nowadays. And uh, it specifies how an architecture for updating the Internet of Things should look like. And it says, first of all, that the bootloader must be minimal containing only flash support, cryptographic primitives, and optionally a recovery mechanism. That's a bit in contrast of what we see uh, with uh, embedded Linux, right? Because the bootloaders are as complex as Linux, uh, almost. They do have uh, TCP IP, some of them. Uh, they are full of uh, um, device drivers uh, and support a number of platforms, uh, but for sure they don't fit into 20K, right? So. Um, the other thing is that uh, um, the, um, the actual transferring of the image, of the firmware image, um, is, has to be implemented in the application. And this is because um, the suit group recognized that uh, there, is, there are too many uh, heterogeneous uh, uh, network devices nowadays on microcontrollers, so we can't just link to a specific technology, right? So if the application is actually moving, uh, just moving the firmware update from a remote location uh, uh, to the flash, it's probably already contains all the um, facilities, uh, the software libraries to access. Uh, it, it already has a TCP IP and, uh, and its drivers. You don't need to duplicate those into the bootloader, right? The bootloader must still be minimal. So the only task of the application is transferring the image from a remote location, but we'll, we'll be back to this because it's part, of course, of the solution itself. And uh, most importantly, um, the, um, the document uh, uh, recommend, recommends that uh, a secure mechanism is used to aut uh, authenticate um, the firmware and this is based on uh, asymmetric cryptography, so on a public key uh, mechanism uh, that has to verify that uh, the firmware is actually coming from a trusted source. Um, there are a few additional uh, um, um, requirements that uh, we decided to put in. We want to be portable across all 32-bit microcontrollers. And uh, this might sound uh, uh, a little bit um impossible but actually we we're getting pretty close to that i'll see and um, we wanted to use sha2 digest to verify the integrity of the system as well uh, because we trust this algorithm for now um we want of course public key firmware authentication to verify the authenticity but this is part of the recommendation of the standard um we want a, a small footprint in order to be able to run on small devices class one devices is a kind of a all the definition, uh, you should think about that as uh, Cortex-M0 nowadays, so with a few kilobytes of RAM and uh, uh, a few megahertz, if not a few tens of megahertz uh, for the CPU, and uh, yeah, it's, it's a very, very limited amount of uh, storage space, uh, for sure, under 200k. Um, we wanted to introduce memory safety. Uh, so that's uh, something uh, I've seen a lot when working with life critical systems. Uh, uh, the worst case scenario is having a malloc. Uh, malloc uh, is uh, very, um, it's a very dangerous function, not, not because it's a dangerous function per se, but because how we developers are used to use it. So it's like, it's better avoiding it completely uh, 
that guarantees you some kind of safety um, and also reduces the attack surface because uh, when you use the heap memory uh, you have a much bigger uh, attack surface so we don't didn't want to use malox at all so we we just had uh, works around for, for workarounds for this uh, interrupts are disabled at all times while the bootloader is running because we want to be able to statically predict every action that's taken and uh, the CPU clock settings must be optimized because some of the operations are cryptographic operations are um, very expensive in terms of performance. Uh, I'll show you some numbers later. So, but the thing that we want is to clock the CPU as fast as we can when the system starts up. Uh, that's gonna be only for less than a second normally, so it doesn't impact uh, on your low power profile. And, uh, and of course we wanted a full reliable update mechanism, which means that we want to implement uh, um, the fallback uh, when something goes wrong uh, with, with the firmware update. Uh, and this something goes wrong is not because of the update that fails to authenticate, because that's just discarded, but it's an update that actually authenticates because it has a valid uh, signature. But it's a signature from a developer who forgot to remove um, some uh, test code from, uh, uh, from the application itself, so the application won't boot. And since this is usually uh, targeted for remote systems that are not physically accessible, you don't want to run the risk the, to, to have bricks around uh, um, where you should have uh, 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 your uh, deployed devices instead. Um, so these are all uh, the requirements that we assemble together for for uh, for a solid, portable, uh, um, and safe, etc., uh, implementation. And uh, what came out of this was uh, Wolfboot, the open source secure bootloader for 32-bit microcontrollers. And uh, it's open source, but it's actually free software, and it's uh, GPL. GPL version 2, I think, and it's uh, on GitHub, so you can download uh, all the code and test it yourself on your favorite microcontroller. Um, so, mm, first of all, the portability has been, of course, uh, one of our uh, core goals. Okay, so the first version was only running on ARM Cortex M, but we recently split the architecture code, so we are able to run on Risk Five as well. And then a few customers said, yeah, but we also want to use the, the PIC32, so we're doing a MIPS32 support, uh, which is still in development. Um, we are OS agnostic. We can run, we can boot, in fact, any existing, uh, or not existing yet, uh, bare metal or real-time OS solution. Um, the firmware is verified the boot time. We use uh, ECDSA. Uh, we use elliptic curve because it's faster than uh, RSA and uh, guarantees the same uh, uh, security with shorter keys. And this part is actually provided by WolfScript, which is the crypto engine and it's the core of uh, the WolfSSL implementation. There is no specific uh, additional hardware required. Uh, uh, the whole solution runs in software. Of course, we do have uh, support for uh, specific trusted elements, uh, uh, or hardware encryption mechanisms uh, that can be implemented by specific manufacturers. Uh, uh, we do have those normally within WolfScript. Not all of them, but of course, if you're interested in a specific uh, uh, hardware mechanism, uh, that can be easily integrated uh, in the whole picture. And, uh, okay, the source code this uh, already mentioned is, uh, is available on GitHub, so uh, feel free to have a look. Um, so another Im interesting thing is that uh, uh, we're not linked uh, on the uh, reset, uh, load the bootloader, stage the OS. We can uh, be chained uh, at different uh, uh, at a different stage of uh, of the boot chain. So, for instance, uh, some manufacturer, say an XP, uh, have uh, uh, an integrated uh, ROM bootloader, which is not a secure bootloader. Uh, it does expose uh, some um, secure features of the flash through the mapping uh, of specific uh, um, structures uh, within the, the, the flash itself at the, at the specific address. But the point here is uh, 
in those cases we suggest that uh, that you put growth boot as a second uh, uh, second stage bootloader so that uh, you can enable all the verification mechanisms uh, and the secure update with the failover um, and also it is important that uh, um, the first stage bootloader has a single point of communication which is still secured uh, because it's immutable according to the to the specs so um, it's the only point that configures I don't know your trust zone M or uh, your um, uh, flash protection mechanisms etc uh, so the other thing is uh, we rely on the multi-slot partitioning of the programming flash and you say oh no my uh, my flash just fits my current application so I can't use this well you should have thought about that and uh, add uh, an SPI flash next to it so you can use the whole uh, programming flash for the program for the running uh, firmware and uh, you can support receiving updates on an external device which doesn't have to be memory mapped we'll, uh, we'll go back on that specific feature um, this one is uh, a panoramic of the components and the APIs uh, of this bootloader the bootloader is, uh, is pretty small so I um, had to, to add a few blocks here um, so the application normally communicates to the bootloader using two uh, API functions they're a bit longer the names than that but this is what they do the first the update says basically to the the bootloader hey uh, there is a new firmware update available for you do your thing and uh, at that point the bootloader will uh, verify probably swap the application uh, uh, put it uh, in, the, in the right partition try to boot etc the second one is used by the application itself to confirm it booted correctly and it arrives to a point that maybe it's connected to the internet again it can download a new uh, update so everything went well so this is kind of a double check because if you miss this call and you reboot twice you uh, after an update uh, we will see that uh, this triggers the fallback um, the cryptography so the signature uh, verification uh, uh, the SHA is implemented using WolfScript uh, there is a bit of specific code the architecture specific code is mostly assembly we provide it for now for ARM Cortex-M and uh, for RISC-V soon also for MIPS-32 and this target specific hardware obstruction that's uh, um, normally uh, the only code that's specific to the to the microcontroller that you're using and uh, it's implemented through this uh, hardware abstraction layer as we said the secure elements uh, and uh, architecture specific assembly optimizations are available but are not um, mandatory to run the simplest version of uh, uh, of the bootloader uh, so again on the hull and uh, the other abstraction layer um, it just consists of a few function calls those are just used to access the flash so remember they um, the specification said the bootloader should be minimal only has to access the flash so these are the functions that you have to implement for the specific chip to access the flash memory which is normally a few lines of code less than 100 and uh, you can do this either using the BSP drivers so basically modifying the examples that are provided by the vendor so you get the ST library MX cube and you call those functions or the Kinetis NXP whatever and uh, or you just do that's that's my uh, favorite way of doing it's just you open the data sheet you see which registries do what and you just access the directory directly the registry so you don't rely on third parties code which is n often written by hardware engineers and uh, not very reliable <laughs> uh, Stefan to take it outside um, So the target specific code, as we said, is very compact. Uh, uh, porting to a specific micro, uh, micro is very, very easy. Uh, it's typically 100 to 100 lines of code, including uh, the clock setting uh, and, uh, and the flash driver. And, um, and there is also the necessity of creating a linker script. Uh, uh, okay, this whole thing is make file based, so it's good for me. I am a GCC guy, it's good for the Eclipse people, but 
uh, it gets a bit harder if you used to other IDEs like Kyle, uh, IAR, etc. But no worries because since it's completely separate from your project, you can still compile Wolfboot in GCC or in Eclipse and then uh, have your, your entire project uh, running somewhere else. Um, so I was saying, um, the link script um, needs to basically tell the, the bootloader where the flash and the RAM are. So even if you open the .ld files, you immediately recognize uh, we provide example HAL and uh, LD for a number of platforms. Uh, you will see that it's really simple to create one for your own microcontroller, especially because we try to cover uh, a larger number of vendors. Uh, so um, we have an XP Kinetis, we have a STM32, we have microchip uh, on the ARM side, uh, Texas uh, Nordic. So you have an idea on how to approach this specific uh, um, uh, implementation for your microcontroller. And uh, so this was about the other abstraction. Now, um, how do we implement the firmware update? This was uh, um, a very important uh, design choice that we have to do at the beginning. Uh, because there are normally two different approaches to this. And that's why. That's because uh, the physical memory mapping constraint. So you compile a firmware that runs from a specific address. And that specific address it needs to be well known and specify the compile time. So if you're normally running a single piece of uh, firmware, it starts at uh, address zero on most of uh, uh, most microcontrollers. That's where the flash is mapped. It can change uh, from vendor to vendor. On risk five, it starts from uh, uh, two zero 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 zero. Um, so it just you have that constraint. You compile the firmware to run there. It's not like Linux, you can relocate it to a fantasy address. It just needs to be there in order to boot because the functions are mapped at those addresses. There is no relocation, there is no dynamic linking, there is no uh, remapping uh, or moving around uh, um, code because most of the code is normally in flash and you're executing it in place. Okay. Um, and normally that's in fact the uh, beginning of the text section of the firmware. So what does this mean from the update point of view? We have two images, right? One is the one that we are running now, and the other one is the update that we received from the server. Uh, so the two possible approaches here are the AB approach, that's what you normally would do on, a, on, a, on an embedded Linux system, right? Uh, you have two partitions, partition A, partition B. Partition A is the one that's running the firmware, means that uh, you receive a new firmware update and you put it on partition B. When you reboot, the bootloader chooses to boot from partition B, probably or not, it has its logic, etc. Um, if you want to apply this to the microcontroller world, you have to ship every version with two different binaries. One is uh, for firmware A, one is for firmware B. And the server needs to know, should they send to that device number uh, 55? Or should they send it to partition A, partition B? Maybe I need some communication protocol that says which one, if it's running on B, I should send an A and vice versa. Or I should send both of them. So this is a bit difficult to deploy. Uh, of course, the bootloader is going to be super easy to implement because there's no swapping needed. You just need to point to an address and say, start from there. Uh, but the, the actual downside is that all the devices you're using need to be executable in place. So everywhere you put a firmware, uh, you need to be able to map that in memory and execute firmware for, uh, and execute code from there. And that's not the case for external devices that you could use for storage that are cheap, as like SPI flashes you can put there, forget about it, you have an extra megabyte of RAM on your Cortex-M0, which normally have 128K, uh, and that's a big advantage. The only thing is that you can't execute code from there. So we went for the boot update approach. So the image is always running from partition A, and the updates are always coming on partition B. When I want to run the new uh, update, uh, I, I want to swap the two images, and uh, when the swap occurs, uh, the, firmware is, the update is actually complete, because you reboot again, and you start from exactly the same fixed point in Flash, and uh, you always have a valid firmware there. 
and it's much more fle flexible because finally you can have your update partition somewhere that's not mapped in memory and uh, it is much easier to deploy because the server sends always the same latest version to uh, to your device and uh, of course uh, has to uh, the additional complexity for the bootloader it has to take care of the uh, reliability of the swapping process um, and also the update mechanism uh, um, is based uh, in the simplest case on this partitioning is uh, four partitions on the programming flash if you're not using an SPI external flash for the update and swap partition but in the normal case you'll have one small 11 to 32 kilobyte partition which contains the bootloader yes wolf boot compiles uh, including all the cryptography uh, normally around between 11 15k if you add additional features or uh, SPI flash drivers it might grow a little bit but we're still talking uh, that's not using the whole flash it's, it's using just uh, a small partition at the beginning uh, um, of the uh, ex execution space uh, in, your, uh, um, in your programming flash. There is the boot partition that's the most important, that the one that contains the executing firmware and it starts at a fixed address so you know where it can boot etc. The update partition has the same size as the boot partition but it might be located elsewhere and it's just used by the application to store temporarily the update that will be validated and probably installed uh, by the bootloader. And there is also a very, very small swap partition. It can be as small as the physical sector on the device, so typically 2, 4K, sometimes alpha K. Uh, and that's used internally by Wolfboot because for, to guarantee the reliability of the whole swapping process, uh, the, the whole swapping process can be interrupted. Uh, and that's because we always have two copies of the same sector. Um, so basically it works like this. Uh, you have a firmware version 1 uh, here and a firmware version 2. When you receive an update you have the firmware version 2 here. Uh, from this uh, uh, situation to the one on the bottom it's the update uh, um, swap which uh, where the, the bootloader is actually uh, swapping sector by sector the, the two firmware using the, this small um, the swap, sw swap uh, partition at the end of the, uh, of the flash. Uh, if something goes wrong and this firmware version 2 is not able to get to the success confirm point uh, within the application, then the next reboot you will have a rollback and uh, the, uh, the firmware version 1 will be put back in place and actually version 2 will be discarded in this case. Um, so let's have a look at uh, uh, another very important aspect and it's uh, how we do uh, key management uh, in uh, uh, real um, uh, real life scenario. Uh, in many cases uh, this is done uh, if you look at uh, other kind of solutions uh, like Azure for instance uh, uh, Microsoft uh, requires you to have a key that's signed by Microsoft etc. Not in our, in our case. You generate your own key pair yourself and you are responsible for it. There is no lock in from any vendor including Wolf SSL on what you do with your keys but of course uh, the security of the private key uh, is the center of the whole uh, um, of the, the whole security of the system so you have to be very careful not to share the private key you keep it just on the machine that signs uh, the firmware and never distribute it uh, it comes by itself the public key instead is shipped together with the bootloader so it's actually embedded in, the, in its source code uh, normally and uh, that's according to the specification there is no way to uh, revoke uh, the keys actually what we did is uh, the bootloader can verify a new version of itself and uh, install a new copy of itself over itself so it means that uh, if a new bootloader contains a new um, public key but it's signed with the old one that's kind of an emergency way to do revocation but shouldn't be uh, taken as a uh, 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 default mechanism to apply the, the, the bootloader because if you, if you look at the suit specification it clearly states that the uploader that the bootloader should be uh, minimal also because it's immutable 
So once you put the bootloader in, um, uh, in your flash device, uh, you should actually lock those pages where the bootloader is and they should never be accessed again. Uh, so as we said, the, the whole security of the system depends on the secrecy of the, of the, of the private key. Um, we ship it with two Python tools. Uh, there is a sign tool uh, that attaches manifest uh, header to, image, to the image and the key generation tool, that's the one that's responsible for generating the key pair. Uh, very, very small and simple uh, Python uh, script. Um, the sign tool does something else. It attaches uh, a manifest uh, header at the beginning of the firmware image. So, and that's used to validate the image itself. So it's the, the one that contains a signature, it contains a version, it contains a, uh, some other metadata like uh, Mm, uh, compile time uh, and other important things, a type of uh, image, uh, a type of the encryptions being used, etc. But it's it's relatively small uh, uh, preamble to the uh, to the image and um, and it's uh, prepended to the to the to the firmware image itself. Um, but since the firmware version is one of those me these metadata, it, it, that cannot be altered because if you are an attacker and try to say that my former version 2 is actually version 5 just by altering the uh, um, the byte that contains in clear uh, the version for the firmware uh, this compromises the entire image because that's part of the uh, of the information that's used to uh, to generate the signature uh, using the, the private key uh, and of course uh, um, Wolfboot can only run um, firmwares that are um, signed using uh, this private key. So the first step is run that Python script and generate this uh, public key, private key. Um, and so this keeper is, uh, as we said, is used to uh, implement uh, um, uh, signing and verifying of the, of the image. Uh, the public key is embedded together with the wolf boot sources uh, to create the bootloader. The bootloader is then flashed into, into the device. Uh, whenever you have uh, uh, a new version of the firmware, you provide the firmware itself and a version number together with the private key. You use the signing tool and uh, the output is an authenticated firmware that also contains that the image at a uh, manifest. Uh, which has the signature, etc., and it's uh, connected to the version number that you provided. I'm stressing a lot on the version number because uh, that's that's uh, actually a very important thing to do. Because when when you do a firmware update, uh, you don't want uh, to downgrade to a pre previous version. You don't want this to be possible because uh, I might know that in your version three there is a vulnerability uh, that's well known, and that might have cloned the traffic, although uh, encrypted. Uh, uh, where you, that you used to, to transfer the image. And in that case, I can just do a replay attack and downgrade your version 4 to version 3 and then use the vulnerability to access your system. So this is actually um, uh, foreseen in the, in, the, in the suit specification. So um, downgrading uh, to a previous image should never be possible. And that's why uh, the, the version number uh, is a uh, responsibility of the development team and needs to be always uh, provided to, this, uh, to the firmware sign tool at the signing, uh, in the signing step. And of course, uh, uh, at the end, if you uh, transfer this authenticated firmware to the device, Wolfboot uh, is, uh, uh, is able to authenticate the firmware itself. How do we um, deal with um, mm, being portable to every operating system uh, and application? Uh, just this is tool dependent, of course. But if you think about on a GCC or Eclipse, uh, you just uh, need to uh, change the origin uh, uh, of the flash and just pretend that your flash starts at this address. This is just the address that we used in this specific example. This image is not in scale. This is the first partition that contains the bootloader with some empty space in the end. But it, this uh, um, fixed address, 24K now, uh, is where the actual boot partition starts. But there is a header at the beginning of the firmware itself. And that's what we use for the authentication. So the actual code for the firmware, so the start of the text must be 256 bytes after the start of the partition. And that's why we use this 6100. 
in this case where we only reserve 24k for the for the bootloader partition of course this is specific to your specific uh, in installation uh, um, and the, the partitioning, the multi-slot partitioning uh, model that you decided, the geometry of the flash that you decided to use at the beginning uh, uh, when you started the project. Uh, so this is the only thing you have to do because everything else is taken care of. Your OS, your application still will think that it's running from the reset uh, when actually it's being staged by the, by the bootloader because there is no actual difference. Uh, uh, the stack pointer will be where it expects it to be, the instant uh, the interrupt vector table will be relocated before um, uh, running a new firmware. So everything is taken care of. Uh, you just need to move one single line probably in your entire project, uh, and you can accommodate uh, the, the bootloader and uh, uh, use all the uh, the features uh, uh, that you expect. This is how the image header looks like. I won't go into details of this, but. As I said, there is a few things. There is a, a Chateau Digest, this is a signature. I'm sorry, it's probably a bit too small uh, for this screen. Um, uh, there is a version tag there. Uh, there is a timestamp tag. Um, and this is basically how, what, uh, how it looks like the, the first 256 bytes uh, before the start uh, uh, of the, um, uh, of the um, firmware image itself. Um, one important thing to say, we described um, the bootloader itself, but it's very, very important to stress one thing. Um, the secure boot part only uh, solves half of the problem. It ensures the integrity and the authenticity of the update. But you don't want people to steal your updates, right, over there. So the application uh, must always ensure that the firmware is received through a secure channel. TLS or the TLS must be used for firmware upgrade whenever possible. When is this not possible? When you don't have, I don't know, 32k of RAM, uh, probably 40k of uh, flash space to implement a minimal DTLS over a UDP IP, uh, because even TCP IP becomes expensive uh, for uh, for. Uh, for, for a lot of devices. So in that case, you still have the option of encrypting uh, your firmware and uh, send uh, at least as a minimal requirement, you should always provide encryption. Well, in the ideal world, you should also store your keys uh, for the encryption uh, um, in... Uh, and also, you know, verify that the client, uh, so the device itself, uh, can be authenticated by the server when you request for a new firmware. But these features uh, cannot be uh, realized on, uh, on normal microcontrollers. You, you have to use some uh, um, hardware uh, secure elements because you need secret keys or you need uh, sec secret certificates in order to, to authenticate to the server on the other side. So this is uh, in the ideal world for making a, uh, the, the full secure update, uh, uh, the full picture, of course it depends always uh, um, on your requirements, but in the ideal world you should also use authentication of the client uh, uh, as well. Uh, but this can be implemented on the application side, but very important uh, uh, to keep in mind uh, that encryption is not provided, the bootloader uh, just ensures that your, your updates get there, uh, that your device is always reachable, and, uh, and that the updates are authenticated, authentic, and uh, provided by a trusted source. Um, I'll show you um, a real-life use case of the deploying an actual IoT um, uh, product. <coughs> That's not a product case, it's just actually the way we you could do this uh, using, using uh, um, using Wolfwood, so it's not specific to uh, a real product, but it's the recommended release cycle, let's say. So you start with uh, the four partitions, right, uh, on your microcontrollers, and you want to put a factory firmware to it, right, before shipping it to to uh, um, to the field. Uh, so you compile Wolfboot, you create your public key, you get your source code, uh, you compile Wolfboot, uh, and you can flash it using a JTAG uh, to your device. This is, uh, this is done once, right? Uh, 
and then uh, afterwards uh, you can compile your firmware, add a version number, use the private key you previously generated uh, and on the deploy server sign the first factory uh, firmware image. So let's say that this version number is uh, one, so we just the first uh, uh, firmware that we ship with the device. So a device like this is already it's already everything it needs to run, right? So this can be already shipped. We don't. We at this point we, we just don't need the JTAG anymore because we don't have to write uh, on the internal flash uh, from the outside world anymore, right? Because it's, it will be the application that will write the the updates to the to the to the update partition. So at this point before shipping what we do is disabling the JTAG this can be done in a multiple ways some uh, vendors uh, just uh, provide a way to lock the flash and uh, the flash is not possible to, uh, to write anymore or to read anymore from uh, the outside world or there is a fuse or a OTP boot procedure anyway we don't need JTAG it's probably safer just disable it so people can't go and uh, um, and tamper our device even if they have physical access to it um, so this is the actual uh, factory device that can be shipped and can, uh, it's ready for the field and a sunny day normal operating condition was boot starts verifies the integrity of the firmware uh, verifies the authenticity of the firmware and uh, boots up this takes some time not very long but takes some time, so it depends on the, the speed of your microcontroller, the assembly optimization that you can afford, uh, um, if you're using a specific uh, um, DSA algorithm that's faster or smaller, um, but eventually it will boot the current firmware. The only way to send an update, um, you have to uh, own the private key, so you have to uh, redo the, the signing uh, procedure and start an over-the-air um, communication with the current firmware that's running here. If everything goes well, the current firmware will store the firmware update in, uh, uh, in a second partition. It will know exactly what the second partition is. And that's it. That's what the application has to do. And of course, uh, trigger the update function that says, um, it tells the bootloader that there is an update uh, um, uh, available. So Wolfboot is notified about the update and checks that the new image is newer than the existing one, the famous version checks uh, I was talking about. Then it verifies the integrity using SHA and then it verifies the authenticity by uh, checking the digital signature of uh, the SHA that I just, just uh, calculated. At this point, if the update is valid, um, then we s it starts swapping the images and uh, in the end you have the previous firmware stored temporarily there and the new firmware uh, in, in the application, um, in, in the boot partition. So at the next boot up you verify again because both boot doesn't trust itself. So after the boot it will verify again that the, 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 the firmware is good and at that point from this moment on it can boot normally and this update partition is available to uh, receive new updates. If something goes wrong, so if the new firmware uh, can't actually confirm itself and there is a boot failed so you get a new uh, reboot and you swap again this is the only case where we allow a downshift of, uh, of the version so we can go from version 2 back to version 1 because this is a, fa a failover and uh, the previous firmware is restored uh, by a reverse uh, uh, swap operation and uh, from th that moment on the, the system can again boot normally. Um, so this is a bit the uh, the flow diagram of the, the bootloader. Uh, after the reset, uh, it, this is the sunny day path, so there's no update available, uh, the current firmware is not unconfirmed, uh, it is authentic, so we can stage uh, the Artos or, or the application itself. If, the update, uh, if there is an update available and it's authentic, uh, we can start the update. Uh, the panic is there only uh, for when you have no images uh, available or authentic uh, on either of the two partitions so it's just the way that uh, the, the, the uh, microcontroller will refuse to boot uh, if, if something goes really really wrong but should never 
and hopefully never uh, happen uh, uh, in uh, in uh, in production. Um, we said about the swap operation. The swap operation are fail safe on most platforms. Why on most platforms? Because it depend they depend on a specific feature that's implemented by 99% of the flash devices in this world, which is you release a complete page, you get all ones, right? You add zeros to write. So if you want to write uh, a number that's not 255, you have to, uh, in that byte, you have to switch bits from one to zero. And that's the only operation that's physically possible on, uh, on our flashes. So from starting from FF, you can get to your desired value by turning off bits, right? Mm -hmm. This operation can be done twice, and it's done. Uh, it's called adding zeros. So you can go from FF to FE to F0, for instance, in two different writes, without having to erase it again. If it is possible to add zeros on most platforms, except a few microcontrollers, and for those we provide a workaround. Uh, but when we provide this kind of workaround, we can't provide. Uh, a guarantee that uh, the swap operations are fail safe. When I say the swap operations safe, are fail safe, I don't have a microcontroller with me, but I could show you an update. The update takes about a few seconds, and you can actually read the board as many times as you want during these few seconds while it's swapping the image from partition A and partition B is doing the update, so it's the most critical part uh, of, the, of the entire update operation, and it will still re resume from where it stopped every time until the operation is complete. So the swap operation uh, is fail-safe in the sense that you can interrupt power while the microcontroller is doing the, uh, installing a, a new firmware, because it keeps track exactly of the last operation. It always has two valid copies, one in the source partition, one in swap. So um, it never overwrites something uh, without having a copy of it. Uh, on the other partition, so it's. Uh, but of course, uh, it requires uh, the multiple zero adding, uh, and uh, one vendor in particular doesn't support that. But I will tell you when I'm not uh, on the screen. <laughs> um, so. Why is that? Because uh, we keep the status. Uh, okay, this is uh, a bit of a pity, but this image is also on GitHub, uh, on it in the doc directory. Uh, it shows a little bit. This is the firmware image. This is the header, and uh, this is where it's stored in the partition. There is some free space, and at the end we keep a few flags that keep the status uh, of uh, the single partition and even the status of the single sector within the partition just to keep track on how things are going. And this is actually the way the APIs from the application communicate with the bootloader itself. Um, so, well, it's, uh, that's not very uh, visible. So There is more documentation on GitHub anyway, so if you want to, uh, to get closer, um, uh, to, 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 to have more information about that. Um, we have two DSA mechanisms implemented. We're using uh, ED25519 uh, because it provides an uh, uh, um, uh, optimal bootloader code size. It's the one that scales down uh, to 11K uh, on certain platforms with generally acceptable boot times, which means boot time sucks. And uh, we do have ECC256, uh, which has uh, a little um, bigger code size, uh, but it reduces consistently uh, uh, the boot uh, the boot time, uh, especially if you use assembly optimization. The figures can change a little bit uh, from uh, uh, microcontroller to microcontroller. Let's say that normally, if you're not, if you don't have real time uh, uh, specification uh, on the boot time. AD25519 is the optimal choice because, uh, jokes apart, uh, uh, on a decently um, fast uh, microcontroller, you can boot, verify the entire image in less than one second. Uh, and still uh, uh, around 10 kilobytes. But of course, if you're in the automotive, you want to go uh, under 50 milliseconds, uh, and there you need a faster CPU and, uh, uh, and using. Uh, uh, ECC 256 with assembly optimization. Uh, this is an example uh, uh, of the measurement uh, uh, I did on uh, Kinetis uh, K64F. 
uh, running at 150 megahertz. Uh, so I'm sorry, you can't read the numbers again, but uh, uh, this is about 20K and this is uh, uh, around 900 milliseconds and the 46. And, uh, and that's the ED255919. Uh, Those are three different uh, possibilities of the various options you have at compile time. Uh, the gray blocks are the code size, uh, the orange line is the boot time uh, uh, in milliseconds. This is one second and this is uh, 35k. Um, so at the cost of 50% uh, bigger codes using ECC 256 with uh, a single precision math and uh, Cortex-M uh, uh, assembly optimizations uh, which make the code a little bigger because of course uh, assembly is a bit more verbose uh, uh, and it has to be in line all the time and uh, uh, but you get to a boot time on this platform of 70 milliseconds which means that uh, with a bit more implement this is all compiled with the uh, uh, size optimization so there is another kind of degree of uh, optimization if you're interested in faster boot time but normally that's the trade-off uh, just by switching on and off uh, a few compiled time um, finally uh, regarding the support for external SPI flash memory um, that's very convenient especially if you remember this uh, while you're designing your hardware um, uh, you can um, you simply have to add uh, a few um, HAL function to implement read write erase operation also on the external memory um, but it's particularly convenient when your flash is really small and your application is already taking a lot of space and actually this is uh, one of the preferred solutions uh, uh, with, the, with, the, with the few customers we have now since it's a very young project um, so it was one of the first things that, uh, um, that we consider implementing uh, uh, to have uh, uh, update and swap uh, partitions uh, on the SPI flash um, there's much more than this uh, of course uh, but um, the time is, is running out so uh, I'll go to the conclusions um, we, w as Wolf SSL, we bring TLS security for end-to-end -end communication uh, in IoT. Uh, we realize that secure updates uh, are important not only to fix the defects that you find on the field, but also for the vulnerability management. Uh, you should use Wolf Boot uh, because instead of reinventing the wheel and implementing from scratch firmware update, firmware authentication, uh, um, all those things, you can rely on the fact that. Uh, um, we are working on this uh, um, constantly and we have tests uh, on multiple real devices uh, um, and uh, uh, it, it is a reliable and, uh, um, and secure uh, and safe update mechanism that is valid for uh, all microcontrollers and uh, you can contact us on a various uh, Addresses. This is uh, supported both as well for any technical question uh, or if you want to integrate it with, uh, um, with your open source project, uh, etc. Uh, otherwise, you can write to me directly or for generic uh, information to facts as at wolfsl.com. We'll be at um, a few uh, uh, events in the, in the next couple of months, so feel free to come and say hi. And uh, thank you, and if you have questions. Thank you.